We are now nearly a year uh, after the pandemic hit. What is your view on what is happening in the world's major economies right now? Well, I think that the, it's it's been a serious embarrassment for the leading powers, particularly the United States and Europe. And it's quite intriguing to look at it in terms of how they thought they were ready for a, a, a pandemic versus how they were ready. Uh, I, I've come, I don't have the source at hand, but I've seen a, a study done some uh, done last year saying that two countries that are most well prepared for a pandemic in the United States and the United Kingdom. Of course, they're two of the worst performers on the globe. At the same time, China, which is where the disease originated, using you know, extremely heavy handed uh, controls, as we all know, we've seen, uh, we would have seen, most of us would have seen videos of, uh, of entire uh, apartment blocks being welded shut so the people inside couldn't get out. Um, but that, nonetheless, that meant that China, which had a population of 1.4 billion people, had 90,000 cases total. And life is back to normal in China. So what you've had is an enormous uh, validation of the more authoritarian form of communism. Uh, and that also, it, it applies to a country like Thailand, which um, is a, a fairly, progressive, fairly progressive state in, um, in Asia. It has a, a, a strong monarchy and all the, the strange politics that goes with that. But generally speaking, you're working in a, in a fairly progressive uh, semi-Western you know, semi economy. And Australia and, and New Zealand, mm -hmm. also successful. So there's no necessity that it had to be an Asian approach that worked. Um, but what you've had is, is, a, is a strong validation of societies that have some uh, component of uh, collective attitudes to their behaviour. So the Australian and New Zealand uh, populations uh, have a, a sense of cooperation with each other, uh, which is, hasn't been totally destroyed by neoliberalism. It's still there. And people will tell, do what the police tell them to do, which doesn't apply in America, of course. Uh, and there's been a consistent message from the governments uh, about restraint and suppressing the virus. And people have followed the instructions and they've worked. So it wasn't a necessity that America and Europe would find themselves in the state they're in. But what they've had is a serious damage to their economies and a year later, it's still not over. Um, something of the order of like even not, obviously there's been output this year, uh, but it's been dramatically reduced over what it could have been if we'd taken the sort of pandemic suppression approach that's recommended by the website in coronavirus.org. And the reason I mention that site is it's run by the person who uh, was one of the most people, people most responsible for the successful suppression of Ebola in Africa in 2014. So he's no amateur, and he said any country that did a strict lockdown uh, where only essential services were allowed to operate, where people were, uh, you, you, you would you'd contract trace everybody so you know which, have, which houses have COVID and which don't. You do that over a two week period, which is the gestation period of the virus. Then the families which don't have the virus can go about their normal business. The ones that do have the virus, another two weeks for them. And then one more week to be sure. He said it could be done within five weeks. Now that's one tenth of a year. So you could have lost one tenth of a year's GDP out of this and it could have been back to normal with no virus anywhere. This virus would have been eliminated from the planet. Uh, instead, even the best performers, uh, like New Zealand and Taiwan, I think would have to rank as the best performers in the world, took about eight weeks to get it under control. And then you had countries like Australia, which, which stumbled early on and then got a second wave, but managed to suppress the second wave. The suppression of the second wave in Victoria, which is a population of about 6 million people and a major city of 5 million people, the suppression process there took about 100 days. So we know it could have been done uh, for a cost of less than one year, uh, for inhibiting part of less than one third of a year's output. Instead, we see America in a disaster at this moment and it's going to get worse for the next four weeks, as we know, because of both winter and Christmas and Thanksgiving still hasn't had its impact on the, on the number of infections. Uh, devastating the economies and the, not giving, because the market economy relies upon people turning up to consume goods and services, the market economy will collapse under the weight of this because people have still got their financial commitments, but they don't have a cash flow. Mm -hmm. So, and we're now likely to see a wave of, uh, of, bank of bankruptcies and evictions in America in particular, which will be incredibly ugly. Um, 
this could break the social compact of that country, which wasn't very strong to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's been a devastating wake up call about how we organize human societies in a world in which we are by far the main threat to ourselves. Does COVID present any economic shifts in your view, or is it just a turbocharger uh, of previously seen trends? Uh, good point. Good question. I, I think I think it's giving us something new because, uh, and I actually made this comment back in I think about February or March on my Patreon blog, that China was already obviously succeeding in suppressing the virus even then. And I said, uh, and as brutal as their methods are, I said that the Z will use this to emphasize to his own people the superiority of the Chinese political system over the American. Mm. And that's exactly what he's done. And uh, to some extent, the same thing is happening in other countries. You know, Australians and New Zealanders are very proud of themselves in, in terms of suppressing it. Uh, but equally, Mongolia and Vietnam and Thailand. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, but the, by far, it's put the emphasis in favour of strong states uh, and away from the libertarian orientation of America. And that wasn't something that necessarily had to happen before climate change hit. Because once climate change hits, I think only centralized states are going to have a hope of, mm -hmm. of coping with the damage it does. This gave it about, about, about 10, that brought that trend forward 10 years. Can you give us a brief overview of the genesis of the present economic dead end street? Yeah, well, I mean, if you actually want to date the day it began, it was the middle of the Bretton Woods Agreement when the American delegation overruled Keynes and said that we couldn't have uh, an international currency invented for international trade, which Keynes called the bank core. We had to use the United States dollar. If mm -hmm. any event set up the current catastrophe we're in, that was it. Because what that meant was, first of all, uh, any, any national currency which is used for international trade necessarily has excess demand for its currency above and beyond what you need to buy its goods and services because you need it for trade to buy goods and services from other countries as well. Mm -hmm. That puts an upward pressure on the exchange rate of the, of the uh, international currency country and ends up destroying their manufacturing sector because the manufacturing sector can't compete. It's, okay. Now, that's, of course, that, uh, that then meant as well, of course, enormous power for the American financial system because mm -hmm. the American financial system was what you needed to buy goods anywhere else in the world. If you were uh, you know, setting up asset takeovers and, and asset purchases and so on, you needed American dollars. So you strengthened the American financial sector and weakened its manufacturing sector. When if you had to look at what made America great, it wasn't finance, it was the industrial sector. So, uh, and, and if you look at what happened in the 1920s, this is a repeat of the disaster of the 1920s when the finance sector took over. Um, but at least in the aftermath set to the Great Depression and the Second World War, the, the industrial sector was back in charge at the beginning of the 1950s and 60s. And those were the golden ages of capitalism. Now, because we let the finance sector become so dominant once more, what you had was immediately a, a rebirth of the trend that gave us the Great Depression. And that was a growth in the level of private debt compared to GDP. And whereas in the 1930s, that level of private debt uh, peaked at about 110% of GDP before deflation hit and hit 140% of GDP as its peak during the deflationary period when prices were falling by 10% per annum, as well as GDP falling by the same amount. Uh, the private debt level in America hit 170% of GDP. Now, that the, 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 the approach I take to economics so it is the, has the opposite conclusion to mainstream economics, which obsesses about the dangers of government debt and ignores private. My approach is private debt is what matters. Government is relatively unimportant. And mm -hmm. in fact, it can be used to attenuate the damage done by private debt. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got ourselves in a, in, a, in a precursor to a debt deflation, far too much private debt, insufficient cash flows to service that debt, a stagnant level of economic demand coming out of uh, credit, whereas credit uh, is part of the normal demand in a relatively well-functioning economy, which mm -hmm. America was in the 50s and 60s. So that was the genesis, letting the private financial sector take over. Mm -hmm. And if we if we'd actually managed to suppress that, we'd still have an, a, a capitalism dominated by the industrial sector, and that's capitalism's real strength. So by letting the finance sector take over, we've really let the rentiers run capitalism. And if you look at Marx and you look at Ricardo and you look at all the great classical economists, including Smith, 
the thing they were most worried about was Rontiers taking over. Will we ever let them? Mm -hmm. So that was the genesis of the crisis we've been in. Okay, I, um, I will love to uh, dive deeper in, into these uh, subtopics, I would say, <laughs> later mm -hmm. on. Um, but first about your MMT legacy, I would say. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. You're known to be a MMT proponent, have been a prominent advocate of different approaches to economic policies for mm -hmm. years. What drove you to it? Well, logic in so many words. Um, I, I, my, whole, my work started, if I look at my academic career, it started in trying to build a mathematical model of Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And that uh, was driven by um, knowing what Minsky wished to achieve. I read, I read Minsky's uh, in 1987. And the book I highly recommend other people to read is called Can It Happen Again? which is a collection of his essays. It's, it's not a full book. Uh, what I read first was a book called John Maynard Keynes. And if you want a really deep explanation of Minsky's theories, that's the one to read. If you want to get through it in an hour uh, by reading a few papers, then read Can It Happen Again? But that was the first uh, John Maynard Keynes, which I read as a, a master's thesis topic, no, master's essay, essay from a master's degree before doing my PhD at the University of New South Wales. And that was the first time I'd read a book on critical of capitalism, which I thought made sense because everything I've read beforehand, like for example, if you're at Baran and Sweezy, Monopoly Capital, uh, mm -hmm. that talked about capitalism having a tendency to stagnation. Now that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't see stagnation, I saw booms and crashes. And what Minsky said is the fundamental instability of the capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to turn doing well into a speculative boom is the primary weakness of capitalism. And he was dead right. And so, but what he, when he tried to do um, in, he tried to make a mathematical model of that. And he used as the basis of that, he used a model by John Hicks, also Paul Samuelson and Alvin Hansen called the multiplier accelerator model. Now I'd already proven as a master's thesis, essay, pardon me, not a thesis. I'd proven that was mathematically un, un, the unsound model. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I knew it was the wrong foundation. So I looked around for an alternative and I used work of a guy called Richard Goodwin and I extended that to include private debt. And then what I simulated out of that is what finally happened, which was not just a debt bubble, but also uh, a tendency for income distribution to get worse. Workers got less, bankers got more. So what I ended up doing was simulating what was happening in the real economy before it happened. I published that paper in, I wrote that paper in August of 92. It wasn't published for three years, courtesy of the journal, um, but I wrote it in August of 92. And after that, what we began to see is what neoclassical economists called the great moderation. There was a decline in the volatility of growth rates. Growth, growth uh, didn't grow as much during booms, but didn't fall as much during slumps. Uh, you had falling inflation and you had falling unemployment over time. And that's exactly what my model predicted before you had a crisis. Whereas the neoclassicals looked and I thought, oh, wonderful, fantastic. Aren't we doing a great job of managing the economy? Quite, to quote uh, Ben Bernanke, he said, this is a welcome change in the nature of the economy. Mm -hmm. I was seeing warning signs everywhere. So that was my initial work and that's modeling Minsky. I can, I can actually show that model if you like, if you want to do a, a screen share. Yeah, sure. um, so this is a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis done in my the software I've invented called Minsky. Uh, and I just want to show just a, a very quick simulation of what happens. What you've got is a growth, this, this is, uh, the basic logic says the, the, number, the amount of machinery you have installed determines output, which determines employment, which determines the employment rate, which determines the rate of change of wages, which gives you the wages bill, uh, which you subtract from GDP and, and, and as well as subtracting interest to work out what profit is, which gives you the profit rate, which tells you the investment share, which gives you how much investment occurs, which comes back and gives you the amount of capital. So it's all this is a logical structure of a very simple model of a capitalist economy. But what when you simulate it, what you see is it looks like it's heading towards equilibrium. If you look at this pattern here, mm -hmm. this uh, running employment rate on the horizontal and the wager share on the vertical, it looks mm -hmm. like you're heading to converging towards an equilibrium. But what you've got over here is a rising level of private debt. And that's a third dimension that's not shown in this particular chart. Mm -hmm. And actually what is going on is this is like a two dimensional slice or a three dimensional object. Mm -hmm. And you've also got a rising amount going to bankers over here. And you can just tell it's happening here, a diminishing amount going to workers. Mm 
So mm-hmm. if, even though the, in this, I've got the capitalists borrowing money to build new factories, uh, but it's the workers who pay with a fall in the wages share. And then after a period of what looks like stability, you start to get increasing volatility and ultimately the system will break down. Mm-hmm. That's a very stylized version of what actually happened in the global economy. So that's mm-hmm. what gave me a, um, a, a predecessor, pardon me, this is my partner's stuff coming up here, um, gave me a, a, pre, a pre-warning that a crisis is going to happen. And then uh, to extend my capacity to model capitalism, I've, I've, the reason I invented Minsky was there were plenty of programs that already do what Minsky does in terms of that flowchart dynamics I've just shown. I can do that in VizSim, um, Simulink, VenSim, I think, Stella, a whole lot of programs already do it. What I added with Minsky was the capacity to model financial flows using double entry bookkeeping. Mm-hmm. And what I've added here, this is a very simple model, deliberately simple, of a government running a deficit, uh, banks creating credit, and a government sending, selling bonds to finance uh, to, after it's made a deficit, paying interest on the bonds. Uh, this is firms borrowing, firms paying interest on the, on the borrowings they've done, hiring workers, workers consuming and bankers consuming. That's a very, very simple model of the economy. Now we have an obsession in, in mainstream economics with running a surplus. What I've got going on here is actually make sure of that. I've got a, I've got a deficit of minus 1% of GDP, which of course is a surplus. And when you run it, and this, 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 if you look at mainstream economists, they think running a surplus is a good idea. Okay? So they'll, they'll hedge and say, no, it should be balanced over the long term. But generally speaking, they end up being in favour of surpluses, particularly the deficit hawks, as Stephanie Kelton calls them. If I run this model, I run it for a while, let it continue. You get a reasonable growth going on there, and that looks all fantastic. Why are you getting growth? It's because at the same time as I've got the government running a 1% of GDP surplus, the private sector is running a 5% of GDP deficit by borrowing non-banks borrowing from banks. Now, mm-hmm. if I change that and say, well, let's actually just say there's no borrowing from banks, so we don't have any contribution from credit, that's effectively zero there, and continue going, then what you get is the economy plunges. You can see the GDP graph over here, heading down for a crash. I've set it up so it only goes for 10 yeah. years. Okay, so that's that, that's showing, this is now an integrated view of the role of both credit, which is what I've modeled in Minsky overall, and now the government sector. And it comes out confirming, I'll just actually go to an opposite situation now, running a, a, de- a surplus of, of say 2.5% of GDP. And if you do that, rather than that causing an economic catastrophe, it causes growth, as you can see from the GDP chart now. And again, I've stopped it at 10 years just for, to save simulation time, because the government running a deficit creates an identical surplus for the private sector. This is the point MMT makes. And uh, I have to say that when I first, um, I, I most of what MMT claimed about government money creation, uh, I was no surprise to me. I know banks create money. Uh, I, I knew I mean, a lot about it, but I'd focus on modeling credit. And when I read Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Myth, she made the claim there, which is an MMT claim, that the deficit itself creates money. Mm-hmm. Now, when I was asked about in the past, I'd say, well, the deficit creates money to the extent to which the deficit is financed by central bank bond purchases. But she claimed, no, that doesn't matter. I thought, well, I better model this. And, and then this with Minsky, I could do it. So here I've got the deficit running. And what happens is the government is running a, a deficit, which means it increases the reserves of the deficit, uh, it increases the reserves of the banking sector by the deficit, and that money is going to firms. I'm just modelling a simple situation where the government only spends money on firms. It doesn't spend money on workers or bankers here. But that's just a, just, it would be exactly the same result if I included the other um, sectors as recipients as well. And he's right, she's right. If you run a deficit, you create money. You put money in people's bank accounts. If you run a surplus, you take money out of their bank accounts. Now, what about bonds? Well, as you're running, the, because we're talking double entry bookkeeping here, when the, when, the, when the banks record that they've put, a, that the government's put additional money in people's bank accounts, they also record that they've put additional reserves in the assets of the banking sector. So the deficit creates money here and creates excess reserves there. Now, normally, banks don't earn any interest, negative or positive, on reserve balances, whereas bonds offer a positive return. So they've got the courtesy of the deficit itself. The deficit creates the additional money in the finance sector that Mm -hmm. can then be used to buy bonds. So bonds are just an asset swap. 
They don't actually finance. They don't create the money that's necessary. And if the bonds weren't sold, there'd be no difference to this part of the model. What would change is that without the bonds being sold, the treasury's account at the central bank would become an overdraft account. Now, mm -hmm. normally, if you, if you and I have an overdraft account, we're in trouble, okay? Mm -hmm. We're paying a higher interest rate than we would on a normal loan. Uh, we get restrictions on what we can spend. But we don't banks create come money. <laughs> we don't create money. The government has created money here. And if, if the treasury runs up a deficit with the central bank, what does the central bank do? Charge them interest? Who does it pay the interest to? The treasury. So in that circularity sense, the government can run an indefinite, um, if it wants to, run an indefinite deficit as it, with it showing up as, an, as a, a, an overdraft account at the central bank. Um, but that doesn't have anything like the ramifications that it has for you and me. So the bonds themselves simply mean that the treasury can keep its deficit, uh, run a deficit while keeping its, its, its um, central bank account positive. And what it's doing notionally and effectively as well, but it's getting down here, it's getting its equities are going negative minus deficit minus interest on bonds. And if you look over here and say what's happening, courtesy of the, uh, the, the government running um, this deficit, then mm -hmm. it's adding to the equity of the banking sector through the interest, and it's adding to the equity of the firm sector through the deficit. All the other terms can cancel out except credit, which we can talk about in a moment. But mm -hmm. what that means is um, the government running a deficit is actually financing the private sector. And mm -hmm. the sum total of the, of the debt the government's accumulated is identical to the increase in the equity of the private sector. Mm -hmm. Now, all these things come out of MMT. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and like I said, this particular discovery is one that MMT people were already aware of. I'm not, an, I'm not, a, an act, I'm not, I'm not a core member of MMT in that sense. But in, in getting this result, I said, well, they're right. And therefore the whole bond vigilante thing is simply nonsense. Bond vigilantes would be banks that were stupid enough to turn down an offer uh, of, of exchanging money in which they got zero interest for money in which they get 2%. That's not a vigilante, that's an idiot. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's, that's what um, converted me to MMT. Now I ha have, I have issues with other parts of MMT. So I think their analysis of foreign trade is nonsense. So that's why I became an MMT advocate, but I'm still critical of the foreign trade stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't want to criticize them at all because I have to, you know, take my proverbial hat off to them because they're the first time a non-orthodox heterodox view of economic policies become part of mainstream discussion. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do anything to, uh, to damage that. But I thought this stuff on foreign trade was nonsense. This is the whole argument that exports are a cost and imports are a benefit. What in particular about it did, did well, you have troubles with? It's, it's naive on too many fronts to, to, to mention. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, one of the first ones is that uh, it presumes that there's what's called an opportunity cost and economic theory of an export. So if you export, you know, an extra Lamborghini from Italy, that's mm -hmm. one less Lamborghini you can use in Italy and therefore Italy suffers and America get benefits by getting the Lamborghini in, in return for pieces of paper that it's sent over to Italy. Um, in fact, there is no opportunity cost because there's not, uh, in, when you look at the, the cost structure of corporations, they don't face rising marginal cost. Mm -hmm. So most firms operate with large amounts of spare capacity. And if you run an export uh, surplus, if you're exporting more than you're importing, then you are using more of your physical capacity as an economy than the country running a, a deficit. Mm -hmm. And you can invest that surplus. You get money effectively, it ends up creating domestic money mm -hmm. uh, for, or forcing the central bank to create more domestic money. And that mm -hmm. means you can invest and grow more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the whole argument that exports are a cost, imports are a benefit is simply wrong. And um, but that's minor. I mean, that that's, the, the mm -hmm. 90, 95% of, of MMT is talking about the government money capacity, the fact that running a deficit is a good idea. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the it's deleterious impacts which can occur that are the, the worry, mm -hmm. but the act, in normally a government should run a deficit because that's creating an identical surplus for the private sector. And from my point of view, what that means is the private sector is less likely to go and borrow money and gamble. If you look at the overall accounting, and again, I'll just actually try to point this out rapidly here. Uh, I haven't shown all the all the sectors here, but the, the deficit that's run by the government ends up being a surplus for the private sector. Whereas mm -hmm. if you look at the private, private non-banking sector, strictly speaking, if you did an accounting of 
uh, looking just in terms of assets and liabilities as your claims and other people and other people's claims on you. Those claims necessarily sum to zero. Um, now, if you have a banking sector, a banking sector by definition has to have positive equity. The very first thing you do is organizing a bank is run up capital. And mm -hmm. then you start with positive equity. And if you get into negative equity because your assets collapse in value or your loans, loans get repaid, you go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So in general, the banking sector has to be in positive equity. That by definition means the rest of the world relative to the banking sector is in negative equity. Now, a reaction to negative equity uh, even though it's a necessity of, of, a, of a totally private sector system. Uh, nobody likes being a negative equity, so what do you do? I oh, think I'll well, go and borrow some money from a bank and gamble on shares or gamble on real estate. And the actual gambling thing drives up the asset prices. So it looks like everything is working. And if you value your assets at the price, the last price the asset actually sold for times how many elements of that are in, our, are in circulation, you get a massive positive equity out of it. You look like you're doing fantastically. Mm -hmm. But of course, then you get 1929 and the whole thing comes crashing down and, and that equity was completely illusory. I, I think uh, government running a deficit actually reduces the encouragement for the private sector to speculate. And given the, the, the damage we've done, as we can all see from the stock market bubbles in the 90s and early 2000s and the real estate bubble in the 2000s, that's just damaging. It doesn't produce anything. It just gives you an overlevered, um, um, unproductive economy. But is is there a problem of uh, allocation of capital when when you you know enhance the public public spending? Um, I think what the, with, with the enhanced public sector spending, what you've got is more cash in people's hands. And and like I, I would, I'm, I'm no fan of bureaucrats deciding how to spend money. I've spent enough time in the academic sector to have my fill of bureaucrats almost at the stage I had my fill of bankers. Um, so I'm critical of that. But things like, you know, if free public education is a very good way for run, to run a deficit. Uh, you know, you, you have to have a military and a police force. You don't want to charge for them. So those, those and you don't want them to be paid either by money. You know, you don't want the mafia being your police force. So there are all, all elements like that that mean that there's ways in which there, there'd be general public services that the public sector should support, supply and finance without taxing back because the taxation actually destroys the money. So there's, there's uh, and then if you get to put money in people's hands and they can decide what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And that's when you, when you look at the fifties and sixties, uh, the government in America was generally speaking, running a deficit. The level of private debt was low. The turnover of existing money, the velocity of money was quite high. It's mm -hmm. plunged ever since because people are now more and more in debt. Uh, they have gone from when, when they're going to be in, the, in what they call the golden age of capitalism between you know, 50, 50 and, and, 60, and 73. Um, the rate of turnover of money was about two. Now it's about one. And one, I think one of the reasons for that is people having so much more debt are cautious about spending, but being cautious about spending, there's less GDP. Yeah. And are we in the Ricardian yeah. equivalents? No, that's bullshit. Ricardian equivalence is total crap. Uh, that's produced by uh, one of the one of the, I think the world's worst economists, Robert Barrow, and uh, that Ricardian equivalence was something he used to explain why governments shouldn't run a deficit at all ever, because mm -hmm. um, he said if a government runs a deficit through Ricardian equivalence, that means we know an identical surplus in net present value terms is necessary sometime in the far future. Uh, so what that means is you, if the government runs a deficit the private sector responds by saving precisely as much and therefore there's no impact. That's for Cardian equivalence. Mm -hmm. Now, when he, he, and in the sort of garbage that goes on as a debate in neoclassical economics is really getting me angry these days. It was stupid enough having to put up with it when I was a professor of economics, but seeing the state we're getting into the global economy now, I have no time for their stupid, how many angels can dance in the head of a pin debates. But if you look at that particular you know, head of a pin debate, uh, some, slightly more sensible neoclassical economist than Robert Barrow, and there's plenty of them because he's, he's, he's a, a, in my opinion, a fool, uh, a politically motivated fool. Um, they said, said to him, well, what if people don't expect the taxes that are going to happen to be levied until after they die? Wouldn't that mean that they would therefore spend more uh, given the deficit and therefore there'd be a stimulus from this? They said, oh, that argument fails if current generations are giving money to future generations out of altruism. Mm 
<laughs> you know, here's a neoclassical economist all about self-interest and stuff, about using altruism as a way of defending neoclassical economics. I, it's, it's, I mean, it, 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 I'd, li I'd like one of these days. I wish I had met Robert Solo, who's, even though he played a major role in building this neoclassical stuff, he's become more and more cynical about how it's being employed over time. And he made the point that if, if you, when you talk to people who come up with this nonsense, and he's thinking particularly of, of Robert Lucas and Thomas Sargent, he said if they love nothing more than to sit down and start discussing technical details of vector order regressions and stuff like this, and you know, and and and, and uh, perfect foresight expectations, yada yada yada. And he said if you start discussing this stuff with them, you've lost the argument straight away. He said you should treat them as if a person sits down on a park bench next to you and says he's Napoleon Bonaparte. He said, now the last thing you want to do if somebody says that is start discussing battle tactics in the Battle of Austerlitz. He said, <laughs> you simply laugh at them. And that's what Robert, Barrett, Robert, uh, Robert Solo said he does to Tom, to, to uh, Sargent and Lucas these days. And anybody comes up with this garbage, it's just crap. We shouldn't take it seriously. And the fact that it got published is a reason to shut down the journals that published it because they simply can't tell bullshit from sensible argument. Getting back on the on the reality ground, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, private spe spending is falling. Be people are sort of saving. Um, yeah. So it's it's not only a uh, like a behavioral shock uh, to pandemic. It's it's mm. more like uh, to what extent the debt has been ac accumulated over the decades, right? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, we, we. I mean, uh, way so back I, in. I believe you yeah. claim that aggregate demand is not only equal to disposable income, but it's it's also determined by 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 the size of debt, right? Yeah, it's um, it's a, an argument that I've had to improve over time. I got it uh, to some extent wrong uh, when I first made the argument, and that mm -hmm. is that aggregate. I just aggregate demand is GDP plus change in debt. Now mm -hmm. that caused all sorts of. Uh, uh, negative reactions from even my own um, group of economists because they mm -hmm. said, well, that's violating the identity of expenditure and income, mm -hmm. which is true. So if you, one of, one, of the, one of the few absolutely ironclad laws of economics is that, is that uh, your expenditure is somebody else's income. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if you sum up all expenditure, you will necessarily get uh, a number which is identical to all income. Okay, now on that basis, most people thought, well, there was no way in which you could have a uh, role for credit in aggregate demand. Mm -hmm. And even though, even though uh, non-Orthodox economists were responsible for arguing that banks create money, which is the opposite of the mainstream argument that uh, banks are intermediaries, uh, even though we pushed that very heavily, even some people in that group when I challenged them about how did people pay for things like houses, the answer was, and I quote, but I won't mention names, uh, out of their savings. Now, that's exactly the same thing as loanable funds. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I've done recently, there's a, there's a new article in the Review of Political Economy, uh, which explains this. I've developed a very simple logical way of showing that credit has a role in aggregate demand and income. And that's using what I call a more table, which is... Uh, uh, something named after Basil Moore. And what, uh, what a Moore table does is shows expenditure on the horizontal of a, a, um, a table of expenditure and income on the vertical. So if you mentioned sector, let's say we're talking households and mm -hmm. they have households as one sector and manufacturing as another and services as a third, then the money that, that households spend on uh, manufacturing would be A dollars per year and the money they spend on um, services would be B dollars per year. So what you show in terms of a cash flow out of their accounts is minus A minus B dollars mm -hmm. per year. And then for those sectors, you have A plus A and plus B. So each roll sums to zero. Now, if you do that just with a pure monetary economy, you get the answer that GDP is the turnover of existing money. Okay. When you add in the neoclassical vision that banks are intermediaries and what they do is they arrange a loan from one group to another group, then if you imagine the household sector borrows credit dollars per year off the services sector, mm -hmm. then it can spend credit dollars per year more, which it spends on manufacturing, but the services sector is going to be spending 
credit dollars per year less on mm -hmm. the other sectors. So credit is positive and negative and cancels out. And all you get is the interest component turns up as part of aggregate demand and aggregate income. When you include that banks create money, then you don't borrow, the household doesn't borrow from the services sector or manufacturing, they borrow from a bank. The bank pushes its assets up and then it pushes up its liabilities. And with that additional money in the liability, the household sector buys off the manufacturing sector. You get a positive on expenditure with no offsetting negative, and you get a positive on income with no offsetting negative. So mm -hmm. credit is part of aggregate demand and income. And the proper expression is that aggregate demand is the sum of the turnover of existing money plus the change in debt. Do I understand correctly that private debt is more of a problem than public debt? Um, yeah, why, absolutely. Mm. Why the paranoia then about the public debt? Um, largely because you've got a bunch of economists, mainstream neoclassical economists, who have a model of which they leave money out of their thinking completely. And in that model, if you think of even simple things like the supply and demand curve, if you think about, uh, you know, showing um, you know, the old intersecting supply and demand, mm -hmm. that tells you that the, the, the mathematics of that is garbage anyway, but the, the visual thing tells you everything happens where the two lines intersect. And mm -hmm. then if you do anything at all to disturb where those two lines are, you create a disequilibrium situation, which is worse. So if you have trade union, well, that's bad. Trade unions are going to drive the wage up. You're going to have an un unemployment, which is the gap between the supply and demand at that price level. Uh, governments do anything, that'll cause it as well. So everything is saying how bad it is to do anything other than let the market do everything itself. And that's uh, deeply rooted in, in the ideology of mainstream economics. If you have that attitude, then all you want is you want, to, you want a government to be neutralized. And if you look at the the pronouncements of mainstream economists, it's almost always about how things are better if you eliminate the government or you eliminate any power concentration such as trade unions. Now, if that were correct, we'd be living in heaven right now. We're living pretty closer to hell. So they've got a model which is false. Uh, but because they have the ears of policymakers, then those are the sorts of debates we have and that's the obsession we have and they completely miss what causes the actual financial crisis. Again, it might be worthwhile if I share my screen for a sec. Let's have you do a better job of, um, of um, flipping back out of it. But this is just some, some of the statistics that I'm using for a new book I'm writing called the a new Economics New Manifesto. And this is showing credit with the annual change in private debt uh, versus unemployment, the, um, the employment rate. So I've subtracted um, the unemployment rate from 100% to get the employment rate. And that's the correlation of credit and, and, and which is annual change in private debt and the employment rate, correlation of 0.81. That's the Great Depression. If I do now, correlation is 0.82. Okay. So it's overwhelmingly strong to show that credit has a major role in aggregate demand and really explains the ups and downs. And of, the credit uh, is uh, the leading uh, indicator. Credit, credit leads, yeah. yeah. It's not the workers borrowing the money, it's, it's the capitalists in this case, so uh, relatively speaking. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a flow through. Now, when you then take a look at that and say, well, what's the, what's the situation over the history of capitalism? This mm -hmm. chart, uh, is, it's data, this, this is a, a data series I had to put together myself. And uh, I'll just actually make it a bit larger here, for people watching on YouTube. So mm -hmm. the red line is the level of private debt in America as a percentage of GDP. Notice by this little uptick here, this is, this is COVID. So you've had a huge increase in corporate debt very, very rapidly. Uh, it's, it's, it's in terms of corporate debt, it's, it's only corporate debt that's risen. So it went from 150% of GDP at the beginning of the year to 153.5% um, by, by one quarter in. We still haven't got the most recent uh, quarterly data. That's the idea of the, of the extent to which firms have been forced to go into overdrafts and lines of credit and mm -hmm. other facilities like that to remain solvent during the crisis. But if you take this line, the, the data to here, by the way, is data just from the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. This from here to here, it's one census series. And from here to here, it's another census series. Mm -hmm. I tape them together using the current data as a way of taping it because the this, this part of the data was way up here and this mm -hmm. part of the data was way down here, but the overlaps were very accurate. So mm -hmm. I put them together and then what I've got is the annual uh, level of private debt. Mm 
And then the blue line down here is the change in private debt per year divided by GDP. And you can see, here's the 2008 financial crisis. You went from credit being 15% of GDP to minus five, and that's the first time in the post-war period that there's been negative credit. Great Depression, two episodes and going on for about almost eight years of negative credit. This is called the Panic of 1937. Huge plunge in credit and a substantial period of negative credit. Those are America's major financial crises. They bugger all to do with government spending. And when you look at it, the government spending actually counted the downturn. So I've, it, it, you know, the, the data is overwhelmingly in favour of the case that I make, but mm -hmm. what gets pumped out is the mainstream belief. And this is because people think economists are experts, they treat them like they're engineers, and we get the same, the same nonsense um, uh, repeated over time, which is irrelevant to the real economy. I got it. I got us back that time. Yeah. What do you think is the most likely coronavirus aftermath scenario uh, to take place? Yeah. Well, I mean, it really came down to whether it be a va vaccine and or not. What to do? What to do about it? I mean, yeah. I mean in the yeah. economic sense. Yeah. Well, I I was expecting it was possible that if we didn't get a vaccine developed, which was like a mass-produced vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, there are. There are boutique vaccines. The, the one which is ones which are currently being rolled out use what are called DNA or RNA technology, uh, rather than uh, the, the type of vaccines which you and I would have had as kids, um, where they're made in eggs and you know, they, they inject a live vaccine into a, a medium. They set up the medium so that it reproduces dead elements of the vaccine. Fundamentally, that gets injected into your body, and that's what gives you your immune system training that means it can resolve, respond to the live virus when it gets exposed to it so you don't catch it. But in, DNA and RNA are saying this use modern gene splicing technology to actually like literally make a strand of DNA or RNA, whichever one you want to do, uh, that matches uh, some part of the virus or gives you part of the genetic code of the virus um, and then inject that into people's bodies. And then that is what the body immune system gets trained on. Um, they've been around since March. Okay. And I have personal knowledge as to why that is and personal experience of it. Um, so it's taken nine months to do the approval. Uh, and now normally they're too expensive to actually do for a mass rollout, but we're doing them anyway, because we want to end this thing as soon as possible. So it looks like by the end of next year, uh, then there'll be enough mass distribution of the, the vaccine in um, America and Europe and parts of Asia that we can resume normal normal commerce. Whether they'll do Africa or not, it comes down to politics. So I, have, I, I hope I hope we do get a you know a decent global rollout of that. If that all happens, then in that sense we can get back to inverted commas normal. Mm -hmm. But what worries me about the so-called normal is that normal is based on another unsustainable mm -hmm. trend, and that's our use of energy and our use of the globe's resources. And I think we're in for uh, serious destructive climate change. And we're only seeing the very beginning of it this year. And with that, uh, the damage to the, the, the sustainability of our societies mm -hmm. will be huge. And I thought we'd be forced into mm -hmm. massive reductions in the level of output. That's mm -hmm. really my expectation for the next 10 or 20 years. But in terms of the economic ramifications of the, of mm -hmm. the pandemic, how is it going to roll out? Uh, I mean, um, we are already in the in the big debt trap. Mm, yeah. And yeah. you know, the the we can sh surely uh, expect like a wave of insolvencies. Yeah. This is this is particularly Where to a big go moment. From yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that that's that's going to be uh, the expression. Is actually, I mean, I mean, I'm Australian. And uh, a lot of Australian humour comes out. There's an Australian song called The Pub With No Beer. Um, <laughs> there's nothing so lonesome, morbid and drear as to stand at the bar of the pub with no beer. <laughs> now, I'm going to use that as a line to say there's going to, we're going to have a, a crisis with no boom. Because if you look at all previous uh, economic crises, they've been preceded by a boom. And that you need that because the boom gives you massive positive credit and then 
when those investments collapse or you know the, the whole financial structure falls over, you go from positive credit to negative credit, that gives you about a, a 20% turnaround in GDP and that gives you a great depression or a great recession mm -hmm. or a panic of 1837. Um, now, we're nowhere near having a high level of credit demand at the moment. When you look at America, the level of credit demand before the crisis was running at about 7% of GDP and it had been flatlining at that level for about five or six years. So there's no, we, like you haven't climbed a high hill. Uh, and normally what you do is then come down to a, a, you come down to the ground, you know, normal sort of level of the, of, the, of the paddock rather than falling deeper. What COVID has done is dig a hole. And so we're gonna come through this period and just barely make it because of, you know, only because of some of the government interventions that are already been done. Uh, uh, things like the, um, I mean, Australia's got a whole lot of schemes they call job keeper and stuff like that. So they've been giving people who would normally be unemployed and getting dreadfully bad unemployment benefits. They give them two and three times as much of those unemployment benefits. Those people are spending, they're covering their bills. It's papering over the trouble. But as soon as you pull all those things out of the way, uh, people have been given a, like a, a debt holiday by the banks. That doesn't mean you don't pay the debt. It means you just don't pay it now, you pay it later. Mm -hmm. So the banks add that debt on at the end and you get through the financial for the coronavirus and you find you've got an increased level of, of debt service necessary. Mm -hmm. And then you haven't got the cash flow, you can't pay it and bang, you're bankrupt. And in America right now, uh, as they're starting to pull those supports away even now because of the transition from Trump to Biden and Trump being, you know, the recalcitrant he is, um, that means the money's going to run out now. We could see a, a, a chain reaction of... Uh, First of all, uh, evictions, both rental and uh, from, uh, mortgage, mortgagees not being able to pay their mortgage bill anymore. And then the financial crisis out of that. So it's a, it's a slump with no boom. I think it's highly likely. And then in the aftermath of that, then the government will come back in and try to do something, but it would have set the situation up by not providing the cash flow that it could have done already to avoid people folding. And if you look at countries which like again the successful countries that have kept this under control one thing that as well as having you know better contract contact tracing uh better quarantine systems uh better regionalization of the of the uh, of the uh, spread of the disease they've also had better cash supports and that means that people because they haven't been spending going out to restaurants and things like that is buying essential services and so on um, they've actually come out with a cash surplus to some extent and that means they can get through it. They don't have to have a slump. But countries like America, which have been stupid about controlling the crisis and stupid about the impact of the crisis, they could well fall into a, a, a post-COVID recession uh, with no preceding boom. Never let the good crisis go to waste, right? <laughs> oh, they're creating another crisis. I mean, this is, this is, when you have a bunch of incompetents trying to steer the Titanic, you end up hitting five icebergs rather than one. Is the private debt jubilee or modern debt jubilee one of the ways? Yeah, out? that would work. I mean, I, I proposed the idea of a modern debt jubilee back in about 2011, I think. And I haven't really updated it ever because I never thought it'd ever be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I'm too dizzy with too many other bloody projects right now, but I, I want to write that up at some point. I've done a, a simple model of that on my Patreon website. How would it work? Would, it's quite simple, exactly the same way a deficit works. You give people, in fact, I can bring that, I've actually got that simulation. Again, I'll see if I can just uh, find that quickly. So what you'd have, and the, the idea of a modern debt jubilee, an old fashioned Jew jubilee just basically, you know, shot the, shot the landlords or, you know, shot the debtors, uh, shot, the, shot the creditors rather. Um, the old jubilees, when they happen, this is where Michael Hudson and the late lamented David Graver were the experts. Those jubilees, liberated people from household debt, but not, um, not commercial debt. Mm -hmm. And they eliminated the debt completely, which freed people from being debt slaves. Today, of course, we have people who borrowed money from banks and gambled, and I'm calling them uh, debtors, so they're down here. And you have people who didn't borrow from banks and gamble. I'm calling them savers. Mm -hmm. Now, with a modern debt jubilee, you'd have the government making a cash injection into the accounts of debtors and savers on an equal per capita basis. So everybody would get exactly the same amount of money. The hypothetical amount I'm using as an example in the book I'm writing right now is $100,000 per adult over 15. And if you did it in America, that would generate slightly over 100% of GDP increase in 
credit in, in, in fiat based money, but you would then say the debtors have to use that money to pay their debt off. This is the bit here. So they, they the Jubilee, they, the, the debtors get Jubilee underscore D, and they've got to use that money to pay their loans down. So mm -hmm. what happens is there's no change in the amount of money. What you get is a drop in the amount of, of debt based money and an increase in the amount of fiat based money. Mm -hmm. And then savers get exactly the same amount of money. And with savers, uh, what I'm doing modeling here is say, you, if you didn't want to create any additional aggregate demand out of giving that money to savers, you could require them to have to buy shares of firms and the firms would have to use that money to repay their debts. So that in that way, you'd simply, you'd, you'd do several things. You'd, you'd replace credit-based money with fiat-based money. There'd be no change in the money supply, but it would be more based on on fiat than on credit as it is at the moment, which it should be. We've made a mistake in letting banks create too much credit-based money. Mm -hmm. uh, there'd be no disadvantage for people who didn't gamble because the ones who did would pay their debts down, but the one who didn't would get the capacity to buy new shares. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, And the firms would pay their debt down. So we'd reduce the level of excessive leverage that firms have as well, which neoclassical economists are also responsible for. Mm -hmm. And then the interest on those, you'd sell bonds to finance it. Well, you don't finance it, but you'd, again, the same old story, the banks would get excess reserves out of it. You'd mm -hmm. offer them Jubilee bonds, which would pay them an interest, and the banks would get the compensation of an interest payment on the money used to create the Jubilee. Mm -hmm. And that would compensate them for losing the income out of money to debtors and out of money for um, firms. So the consequences would be you wouldn't destroy the financial sector, you would give them an independent source of income to mm -hmm. provided by the government to fix the whole error up. You would have the, you said the savers equity would increase by the value of the Jubilee they got and the debtors were up here would increase the amount of money would not change, pardon me. They would, um, well, you know, they, you know, they get an increase in equity, but it mm -hmm. means a swap off of uh, a reduction in their debt level. But yeah, that would be the way to do it. And we'd have a more fiat based system, less credit and a more effective economy. And until then, um, since you've mentioned the hole that uh, that COVID d dug for us, yeah, are we doomed to deflationary environment until we kind of get out? Yeah, that's that's the real problem. I mean, if you think another about Japan what's happened. Another Japan from the nineties. Uh, sorry. Well, another Japan from the nineties. Similar, yeah. I mean, if you look at again, looking at Japan, Japan was the canary in the coal mine that should have told us how this coal operated. And we completely failed to learn the lesson from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they've been stuck in ever since is deflation until they've reduced their private debt level from about 225% of GDP, which it was in between 90 and 95, and 175%, which it is now, 160%, I think. And, and that took them 30 years of stagnation. You know? So I think we face something like that because our governments are just, you know, unfortunately, led by economists who've had uh, a frontal lobotomy by learning neoclassical economics. <laughs> okay. Um, will the government or central bank intervention be necessary? What are mm. they doing now and um, what they should be doing with their money creation capabilities? Yeah. Well, the trouble is what they're doing mainly now is QE, mm -hmm. quantitative easing. And if you look at, again, I've done models of QE, which I won't try to go through here because they would get yeah. rather complicated. But the basic story of QE is it's another asset swap. Uh, so the central bank, the central bank can do QE without needing to bring in the treasury. Mm -hmm. Because what the central bank says, they've already got you know, private banks and financial institutions with accounts of the central bank. They say, and this is what Ben Bernanke did back in 2009 or 2010, is say that in the open market operations that the central bank does with banks all the time to try to maintain the target rate of interest that sets uh, for government debt. Um, in those operations, tr uh, the Federal Reserve promised to be $80 billion on the buy side every month, every, 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 you know, every year. That's roughly a trillion dollars. So what it would did, it put an entry with a, effectively a trillion dollars in the deposit accounts of the banks at the central bank, which increases their reserves and recorded that they now owned a trillion dollars worth of bonds on the asset side of the central bank. So mm -hmm. it had no effect on the central bank's equity, okay? but it, it didn't create any additional um, money in the, in the private sector because it swapped bonds for reserves. So mm -hmm. the bonds of the banks go down and the reserves of the banks go up and the reserves don't earn any interest, bonds do. So what that is doing is saying, you should go and 
use those excess reserves to buy something else which earns a return. And of course, what people, what bank, what people, what, what banks buy and financial institutions buy are shares. Now, of course, to buy the shares, the money comes back into the reserves again because people selling the shares bank at the bank. So you don't actually change the amount of reserves in existence, but you drive up, you have an immense buying pressure mm -hmm. on shares. Now, Bernanke literally argued, and I've got papers that did establish this. He would argue that was being done for the wealth effect, which would encourage consumption and help the economy boom. Well, thank you very much, Jeff Bozos and everybody else who got a large increase in their share wealth. Thank you for buying more, you know, chickens at Henny Penny. Um, if you want to stimulate demand, you give it to the poor, not the rich. The rich don't spend anywhere near as much or near as rapidly. That's one reason why they're rich. Yeah. Um, so if you want to stimulate the economy, it's the last thing you do is make the rich richer. But that's what QE did. Now, because, again, central banks are start predominantly by neoclassical economists who are living in this fantasy world in which the government's a bad thing, even though they're bloody well employed by the government, um, they, they will fall back on those conventional tools. And what we're seeing it now is a huge increase in, again, QE still happening, making the wealthy wealthier. And that's where the K-sharp recovery is coming from. Now, that is adding to the inequality that the private capitalist system caused itself through the increase in private debt during the boom. So they're making the symptom worse and saying that's going to cure the disease. What would you do if you were the head of uh, the Fed or ECB right now? I'll do the, the modern debt jubilee. Mm -hmm. I'd create, and that's a treasury operation. The treasury has to be involved in that. I, again, the example I'm giving in the, in the book I'm writing right now is $100,000 per uh, adult over 15 in America. And that adds up to slightly more than a year's GDP, which is slightly more than two thirds the level of private debt. Uh, and, and you could therefore reduce the debt load from 150% of GDP to 50% of GDP. You could relatively democratize share ownership because the, the, it would tend to be people who, you know, workers and lower middle class people who are the beneficiaries who didn't have as much debt as, as wealthier people and, or speculators. Um, so you democratize share ownership, you'd actually boost the potential spending power out of that, you'd reduce the debt load on the economy, which would make people less, uh, less cautious about spending because they wouldn't be worried about hanging on to money to service their debt. So I do a modern debt jubilee. That would mean we could come out of this crisis with an economy less financially encumbered and potentially have a boom afterwards rather than the slump I expect we're going to fall into. What is your view on uh, ECB policies? What do, what, do you, what do you think about the ideas of the uh, digital currency introduction? I'm actually in favor of central bank digital currency simply because one reason central banks make the bad decisions they do right now is they have no other conduit uh, for their policy apart from the accounts of financial institutions at the central bank. So it's very easy for the central banks to say, we're going to put $80 billion dollars per month into the accounts of financial institutions because they literally have those accounts at the central bank. Now, if you and I had an account there as well, then it would be feasible to say, well, let's do it through that account rather than having to go through private bank accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, that would still involve, I mean, the, 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 the central bank could hypothetically um, buy our debt office, you know, and, and value that it's bought the debt and has a share in our homes. So it could do a fictional version of what it's done in, in real terms with QE, but generally speaking, that would be sitting there as a, as a way that the treasury could rapidly provide a, a stimulus uh, to the private sector without having to do its own, you know, sometimes crazy spending to do that. And um, yeah, and, and there's other advantages as well, but I, I would like to see central bank digital currencies come in. That's one thing that some central banks are talking about doing that I think is something we need for the future. Uh, which countries are in the worst position in terms of indebtedness, in your view? Oh, well, America, uh, fundamentally, because it's, it, 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 if you look at the long-term history of the place, it, its best performance uh, is, is when it's got a debt of about one third where it is right now. Okay. Uh, and then Denmark, Australia, um, the Netherlands, Uh, all these countries have got enormous debt levels. Often their debt levels are just subsidized by having an export surplus. So they've turned the export surplus into a stimulus for high house prices. Um, but because they have the export surplus, they can run a, 
you have the private sector to be running a large uh, deficit with the banks and still accumulating a net positive outcome. I, I find the countries that have let them to themselves turn a trade surplus into a massive level of private debt, they're probably the ones that I think are most badly encumbered. Mm -hmm. um, the case of Slovenia, um, mm -hmm. it's been reducing debt levels since 2008 steadily. Mm -hmm. uh, like private sector uh, lowered its uh, indebtedness uh, by a third. Yeah. Uh, corporations uh, lowered, private corporations, non-financial, lowered their indebtedness by 50%. Households, uh, households um, <clears throat> increased their credit by 30%, but, uh, mm -hmm. but also, um, um, but also increased their savings uh, for, uh, by 60%. And um, the country has had no recession since uh, 2013. Um, okay. And that's fairly common, unfortunately, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what, what is your take on that route of, of uh, debt uh, movements? Now, the trouble, the danger, if you have the danger of straight private sector debt reduction, is it, is it tends to cause what um, I call Fisher's paradox. As Irving Fisher, who mm -hmm. was the first person to develop a debt deflation theory of mm -hmm. the economy, uh, and that's after he he was of course the main developer of neoclassical economics on finance before the crash, and that's why he lost his entire fortune mm -hmm. and ended up being effectively in bankruptcy, only rescued by a wealthy uh, sister-in-law. Um, but he coined the other expression, the more debt is paid, the more they owe. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you pay down your debt using your existing cash, then your, your cash deposits fall and your debt falls. And mm -hmm. then what it means is you've got less cash, which gives you less GDP. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get this terrible outcome of paying off the debt and the GDP falls by more than you pay the debt down. So your debt ratio rises. And that was what happened if you look at the, um, I mean, again, to bring this data back up again, I've just reached, I don't have data in Slovenia. I might actually get that off you later. Mm -hmm. um, but if you take a look at the, um, uh, the 19, uh, 1930s and what actually happened uh, at that point, I'll just bring up this, this chart again so I get to the right point. Hang on. Okay. And you can see here is the ratio of private debt to GDP in America. Mm -hmm. And you can see from 1929, to 1932, I'll just bring up and show, I can show the numbers there. Then mm -hmm. it it rose by um, uh, over 100% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that rise, when you come down here, what was happening to the change in debt? The change in debt was actually negative. Okay. So for this whole, if I start here, and so it's on, that's in halfway through 1930, mm -hmm. um, the rate of the credit is negative half a percent of GDP from that point mm -hmm. on. Okay. But by the negative, what you've got is negative credit and rising debt ratio. And the reason then the debt ratio is level of debt divided by GDP. Mm -hmm. So as you were paying down the debt, the GDP is by falling them by more. And that's the real trap of just a private sector approach to deleveraging. It's why you should use the government sector to do it for you. What books would you recommend to our audience? Who would want to learn more about proper monetary nature of capitalism? Uh, the Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton is a very simple introduction to the capacity of the government to create money. Uh, I'd then suggest reading my book, which is actually you can just see on the screen down here, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis? My answer to that was yes. Okay, before the crisis, the answer is pretty much no now given COVID. But that, that, the combination of Stephanie's book and that book of mine will give you an understanding of government money creation and private sector money creation and then tying the two together. Mm -hmm. If you want to go deeper still, then as to why I rubbish neoclassical economics, uh, what I've done in debunking economics is bring together all the various critiques that have been made for the last century that they continue ignoring, even critiques they create themselves like the Sonnen, Schoen, Mantel, De Brewer conditions. And I can explain those as simply as is possible in words alone in that book. And then if people want to learn what we should do with economics, then there's a new, there's a book by an, he was Austrian. His family moved to America during, uh, as like refugees during the Second World War. And then because he couldn't stand American politics, he moved to Australia. Uh, 
mm-hmm. and became a professor of applied mathematics there. His name is John Blatt, B L A W T, and that book uh, called he wrote a book called Dynamic Economic Systems back in the the, the late seventies, early eighties, and that, in my opinion, is still the best introduction to how economics should be done, mm-hmm. as well as what's wrong with the mainstream. That's for people who make a technical read, but I'd mm-hmm. highly recommend that collection of books and then wander around out the whole lot. And that's uh, the original, yeah, read Hyman Minsky, Can It Happen Again? Mm-hmm. And that'll give you uh, an overall perspective. I'd, I'll throw in one more book for those who were masochists, and that's Joseph Schumpeter's uh, The Theory of Capitalist Development. Okay. And that, that again gives you a, a sort of organic view of capitalism as an evolutionary system. The day one when I entered the economic faculty here at the university, we were hit by the massive book from Paul Samuelson. Um, yeah. Economics. Did you actually got Samuelson's, did you? Yes, yes. Ah, ah. From the beginning. <laughs> oh, you poor bastard. Uh, what, what year was that, if I can ask? 93. Wow. Okay. Is that Samuelson and Nordhaus in that case? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's that's an intricately wrong theory promulgated by somebody who I think will ultimately be tried for crimes against humanity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that is probably one of the books from the top list that you would not recommend to follow. No, definitely. You need an antidote to that damn thing. You don't need to read it. I mean, the, the, Paul Samuelson. I mean, the, 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 we see where this all went wrong. Samuelson tried to make Keynes consistent with the neoclassicals or Volrans and Jevons and so on. And in doing it, he, he, he bastardized, completely cauterized Keynes and then had a completely equilibrium vision of how the economy operates, which he then got involved in a debate over in the 1960s, known as the Cambridge controversies, and lost and conceded that he lost the debate and continued to pump out the same garbage in his textbook. He improved it a bit. He wrote <coughs> some sections on on how Marx was better than he realized Marx was, um, but he never conceded in, to the students that he'd lost the fight that he conceded with his rivals at Cambridge University of the UK. And I see that as a very mendacious text. My favorite piece of mendacity in the whole thing is in a section, he explains how you derive a, an individual's demand curve and shows that if you have an individual demand curve and you Uh, compensate for price effects, what's called a Hicksian compensated demand curve, it necessarily slopes down. So higher Mm -hmm. price means lower demand. He Mm -hmm. then says, does this apply to the market demand curve? It certainly does. (laughs) Well, it certainly does if you believe Paul Samuelson in an article written in the 50s that there's a benevolent dictator in every capitalist economy who reallocates income before we consume Uh, so that everybody's equally happy about the distribution of income. And that was literally the assumption he used to be able to bridge an individual to a market demand curve. It, it's it's garbage. And that's why I tell people, don't read the textbooks. Um, read the original literature and, and, and see where this stuff is based and you'll be horrified. A couple of topics yeah. more uh, for us to cover. Your view on the shift from globalization to localization. Yeah. You're in Thailand at the moment. Uh, what is your view on uh, RCEP, the, the regional agreement? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, the RCEP means something from uh, climate change to me. Uh, no. I'm, in fa- I'm in favor of regionalization and localization and getting away from globalization. Uh, when you look at the argument for globalization, it's always started from Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. You know, you're better to specialize at what you're better at and not do the other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, empirically, that's been contradicted by... Uh, 50 or 60 years of data. Uh, if you take a look at countries which have successfully industrialized, they're ones with a diversified industrial base. They don't have a specialized base. And there's, if you look at the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which are, there, are, there are two of them, uh, one in Harvard University, I think the other on MIT, and mm-hmm. they just use empirical data on the SRTC codes. And you'll find the countries which are most successful in terms of the highest level of welfare, the highest level of growth and so on, are ones with diversified industrial structures, not specialized. Mm-hmm. The specialized ones in, in way, way down the list, including places like Australia and Senegal. So specialization does not promote growth. It was a myth to begin with. Mm-hmm. And I, I talk about that in one of my books as well, and also a cartoon book uh, called uh, Econ Comics as to how comparative advantage was always a con job. What it really was driven by is low wage costs. And on that mm-hmm. basis, Initially, that meant, you know, American corporations shifting production out of 
the, you know, the heartland of America, which now becomes the Rust Belt, which now votes for Trump, and then moving that production to the third world, uh, paying much lower wages and pocketing the difference as extra profits. And the only reason that China did so well out of that is that China, uh, when it began its, its uh, industrialization program, uh, using the Shenzhen Free Trade Zone. And I was in there, but I went to Shenzhen in 9182 before they finished building it. So I'm talking from having met the people who are actually designing the mm. tr Free Trade Zone and its objectives. They insisted that any American company that took advantage of that offer of much, much lower Chinese wages than American mm. um, had to have a Chinese partner. And within five years, the Chinese partner had to own half the business. Now, for American corporations to agree to that, you can have an idea of the scale of gain they were getting out of paying lower wages to Chinese workers. Mm -hmm. So the impact of that was that China got capital formation, uh, capitalist formation, because a lot of the old you know, communist apparatchiks became capitalists. That's where places like Foxconn came from and, and, and Huawei. And you have um, uh, you know, boost, massive boost of aggregate demand over time. And they got American technology really rapidly, which is what they really wanted. So mm -hmm. America, China did very well out of globalization. But when you look around the world, the countries that did best in terms of growth over time are ones that protected their domestic economies, industries, uh, but, in, but put pressure on them to industrialize so they could compete with imports over time. That's what Japan did, what South Korea did. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that's, and that's the successful approach. So globalization has always been a con job. Uh, and we given global warming as well, a large part of the damage we do to the biosphere comes out of transportation. Even the container fleet itself, if we could eliminate the, most of the container trade, except for stuff that can't be imported, can't be produced in one, one economy, um, then we could put a major hole in our carbon emissions and we need to do that. So I'm very much in favor of going back to localization. What about the recently signed uh, regional agreement between the Asian nations, RCEP? To some extent, those regional agreements uh, are necessary when you have economies of scale to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. For example, if you wanted to build a, tele a, 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 um, a wafer plant for uh, semiconductors, mm -hmm. you don't want to have, you can't have those in a country of 5 million people. Uh, the economies of scale are so great that you need to have them on a regional basis. Mm -hmm. So regional agreements of that sort, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, mm -hmm. uh, where economies of scale make it necessary. But mm -hmm. for a lot of production, um, the economies of scale are, are well and truly exhausted within your domestic economy. Certainly economies like Thailand with 60 million people mm -hmm. uh, can produce most of what it needs for its own, own people. It doesn't need to be uh, importing a huge amount. And the more it, the more it manages to produce domestically, the more it industrializes and gets that diversified industrial base and becomes self-sufficient. What is your take on uh, relations between China and your home country, Australia? Yeah, um, well, Australia has gone the complete globalization um, junket and has almost eliminated its manufacturing sector. And specialized in what it's very lucky in, in, in having and, and good at exploiting raw materials. Now, of course, that means that it, it doesn't, it has one of the lowest, one of the lowest uh, levels of manufacturing sector complexity in the Western world. Uh, it, it ranks down at the level of countries like Senegal and, Ma, and, Ma, and Malawi. You know, it, it's, it can't produce sophisticated uh, goods, uh, not even cars anymore. So in that situation, uh, when China puts the screws on, then Australia has no alternatives. Now, I think um, it might, it's actually a bit of a wake up call to Australia because one of the arguments uh, even neoclassicals would accept is the old what's called infant industry argument or defense capability argument. If you can't produce it yourselves, you don't want to go to war with somebody who can. Uh, so in some ways, the fact that China is doing this now is a slap on the face in Australia saying, uh, that last, what you've done for the last 40 years, that wasn't a good idea. Maybe you should rebuild your industrial capabilities. So I'm hoping that'll be a bit of a wake up call, but I'm not particularly, uh, I'm not gonna hold my breath over it. Okay. And uh, for the end, I would like um, to learn your, about your opinion on the proposed Joe Biden's economic team.
Um, I'm not particularly fond of Janet Yellen being in there. I mean, Janet Yellen is, is she's certainly more reasonable than Bernanke. Yeah. But for example, she actually spoke, I mean, uh, she spoke at the Jerome Levy Institute, uh, which is based in Bard College in upstate New York at the annual Minsky conference mm -hmm. in, I think, about 2003, 2004. So, you know, take my hat off to her for going to a, a, the, you know, the, uh, it is actually not Daniel in the lion's den, but the lions in Daniel's den. Um, so going in and seeing the opposition. And what she did at that paper was, was say how wonderful it was the derivatives existed because they were going to stabilize the financial system. Okay. Well, she had, she had again, she had the gumption, again, credit here. She went again to a later Minsky conference and, and basically apologized for a previous presentation. Uh, and, and she cited one paper by Minsky in that speech she gave. Now, I went looking, where was that paper? It was some damn obscure thing that hadn't even been published that some of her staff would have found and given to a bibliographer so it looked like she read Minsky. So, you know, she's you know, putting on the clothing without having the substance of being an alternative thinker. So I don't have a great deal of time for, for her. She's better than Bernanke. She's certainly better than, uh, better than Powell and some of the others uh, who could have been put in that position. Um, but no, no great enthusiasm. What about the whole armada of BlackRock executives? From yeah, Larry, I know. Larry yeah, Fink, I mean, Brian Deese and Wally Adeyemo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, in this, the, the finance sector has taken over the economy. This is why you should actually have a good talk to Michael Hudson one day as well. You know, you know Michael Hudson, uh, a great friend of mine and a fellow uh, critic of mainstream economics and finance. He, he talks about um, the, the policy of, of um, economic managers being to save the parasite rather than saving the host. And that's what's really going on here. And, and it's partly, be, he, he, point, he points out that when a parasite takes takes over a host, the first thing the parasite has to convince the host is that it's actually to the host benefit to have the parasite grow bigger, okay? Yeah. And so we get this mental, um, you know, drugs coming into our brains and uh, convincing us that the, letting the parasite be, gets bigger is good for us. This is happening again. We should be hiring industrial capitalists for those sorts of pieces of advice, not the finance sector. So again, it looks like a continuation of the Obama administration. Well, uh, Professor Steve Keen, thank you so much for this fantastic talk. Um, where can the audience uh, stay in touch with you? Okay, I'll do another share screen here, which I'll just actually get ready over this side. Uh, I am no longer working at a university. I'm, I have an honorary position at uh, the University of College London, but that's only honor. And of course, I'm not in London right now. So the main thing I have is a website called run by Patreon, and that's uh, www.patreon.com slash Prof Steve Kane. And that's where most of my posts go. I have a, a large number of, of patrons there who support my work. Uh, but one thing I asked them when I, when I began doing this is, do you want me to make the posts exclusive for you or do you want me to make them publicly available? And overwhelmingly, they said we want them to be publicly available. Mm -hmm. So the only posts that aren't available to anybody just browsing the internet are my podcasts I do with Phil Dobby because it's partly it's Phil's income as well as mine. So we charge for podcasts. You've got to pay $10 a month or more to see the podcasts except we put about one every once a month, we put out one for free, but everything else there is free. So you don't have to come and support me. Of course, I, I like the support. Um, it gives me a chance to, to do what I'm doing free of the bureaucracy of universities. And hopefully one of these days I can hire a research assistant or something and, and take some of the load off myself in terms of maintaining my stats and that sort of thing. Uh, but generally speaking, you just want to read the analysis, go to patreon.com slash Prof Steve Kane. Great. Thank you so mm. much. Looking forward to our next talk sometime in the that future. Was a lot, did I make, but it was a lot of fun to talk to you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.